thread is the Deacon ad. Uh, it's in here. Um, Crossroads, because it used to be a tome and cross the floor, right? Yes. Okay. So a combined parish, um, and he is the deacon there, so we are blessed, blessed to have him with us this morning. Lots of announcements, lots of stuff happening. As you guys know, the big thing is next week is the annual meeting. Um, we are still planning for that to go on as scheduled. Um, and then, anyone who's in confirmation, so there's two for sure confirmation kids here, Make a note that what is written in the bulletin, the times are wrong. It is from 5 to 7 tonight. So cross out that 5.30 and type in, or write in 5. So um, that is, I, I just want you guys to uh, look at the bulletin. Lots of announcements are in there. Um, otherwise, that is, let us begin what? Yes, we are chaperoning tonight. Very, very good. Um, let us begin first. Thank you. I invite you to rise as you are able in body or spirit for our confession and forgiveness. Is this bad? Oh, oh, yeah. you're not. Right. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let's take a brief moment of silence to confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your mercy and love with others. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us, so that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things that have come to pass, new things I now declare to you. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior.
Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Lord God, your loving, loving kindness, kindness always goes before us and follows after us. Summon us into your light and direct our steps in the ways of goodness that come through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for our first reading. Our first reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been delighted? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Our responsive song today is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, that I will seek after to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will, will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, see his face. Your face, Lord, do I see. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. All right. At this time, I would like to invite any kids forward for a children's message. Do you guys want to come join me up here on the steps? I've got something for you here, too. You guys usually meet up on the steps here? Yep. Okay, great. This works. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. My name is Deacon Brad. Can you guys tell me your names? Your are Okay. Hey, I have a question for you guys. Does anyone here like fidgets? Yes. Yeah, do you guys like fidgets? Actually, I brought a present here for everyone today. Um, I want to give you these. They are all of them up so people can see. It's a little fish cake. 
it's a pipe cleaner. This isn't like super fancy rocket science here. But it's got some beads on it. <coughs> Excuse me. And I made these for something else, but I have them because the, our Bible story today talks about um, people fishing. And I thought it was kind of cool. And on there, you'll see that there are, can you see how many, how many clear beads there are on this one? Can you count them? One, two, three, four, five. And then how many of the different colored beads are there? There's one, two. Does, does anyone know like what five and two might be related to fish in, in a Bible story? Five loaves. Five loaves of bread and two two fish. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of a cool little reminder here. So I'm gonna pass these out. There you go. I've got some different colored ones here. Can I give these to you? Can you guys hand some of these down here from me? Yeah. Well that, that fish is his, his fins got bent. They're pipe cleaners, so you can kind of go over by you. It's okay. Here we go. Let's pass it down. You want one? Does anybody here like to fish? You guys? I never like fishing. Fishing. You've never gone fishing? Okay. When you guys, if you go fishing or you've seen people fish, what do they fish with? Worms. Worms. Or fishing rods. Oh, I mean, both, you're right, right? Worms, or fishing rods. Yeah, there's a bobber, right, that's going to float out there and you can fish. Has anyone here ever gone um, fishing and then, like, not use that stuff? Has anybody ever, like, gone in the side of a boat and then, like, had, like, a big, huge net? Oh, you like threw a net in the water? Yeah, and you fish like that? Yeah. Probably not a net. You know what? He caught really big ones. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Oh, my grandpa had a boat, a net, I had a boat, and we went fishing on it over the summer, and it had a, like a hand net that we put into the water and waited for swim fish to swim in. There you go. So sometimes we use those like land, they call them like landing nets. So like maybe you catch the fish with the, the pole and you get it up to the boat and then you kind of like the help it into the boat with the net. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, we're fine, but I've never went out of boat. You've never run out of boat? Well, maybe. I've never went on the boat. Oh, I'm just I've been on the boat. Oh, yeah. been now, what if, what if I told you, you guys, um, that this morning I, I wanted you to go fishing? But in, I don't want you to catch any fish at all. I want you to catch people. What would you tell? What would you say to that? Fishing for people. Fishing for people. Yeah. I want you guys to go fish for some people. How would you do that? Throw someone in the water and catch them with a the fish. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they can swim, right? And they don't say I can only dog paddle. Um, boy, it's it, it's kind of what this this story that we're gonna hear. I guess I haven't read it yet. Um, but the story that we're gonna hear, Jesus tells people that he thinks that they should fish for other people. He's like, he's starting this whole movement in this Bible story, and he says that we should fish for people. Drop your fishing nets, leave your boat, come and follow me. Do you think that we fish for people as a church? No. Where our church fishes for people? I definitely fish for people. Yeah, I like that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Definitely. I think the way I was thinking about it is kind of like, like, we belong to God, right? We belong to God. We are his children. Yeah, we're all God's children. And so when he tells us to go and fish for people, I think that's what he's saying. He's saying, go and share this message um, about how we belong to God. Will you guys pray with me? Let's pray together. Dear God, oh, I'll have you repeat. You want to say that? Let's do it like that. Dear God. Dear God. We love, you. we love you. Thank you for teaching us about fishing. Thank you for teaching us about fishing. Help us to fish for all kinds of people. Help us to fish for all kinds of people. And know that we belong to God. And know that we belong to God. Amen. Amen. Alright, you guys can have a seat. Thanks so much for coming on. Please rise for the gospel affirmation.
Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth, and he made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken to the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land in Zebulun, land in Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left with their nets and followed him. As he went out from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may have a seat. Grace and peace to you, my friends in Christ. I'm so happy to be joining you this morning. I am your, uh, your guest preacher. My name is Deacon Brad Mills. And I'm a, a ELCA ordained minister in the area, and I currently serve uh, actually as a, as a part time minister at Crossroads Parish, which is made up of two different churches it's Atonement Lutheran in New Brighton, and then uh, Cross of Glory Lutheran in Moundsview. I live in Moundsview, actually just down the street from uh, Cross of Glory, and uh, I, my kids go to Pinewood Middle School. And I'm married to a woman named Karen Mills, and we have three little girls. We have a fourth grader, a second grader, and a four-year-old. So we've got a busy house. It kind of looks like this. It's, it's awesome to see this up front and center here. <clears throat> um, speaking of Pinewood, I actually have gotten to know your pastor, Pastor Ivy, a little bit, because Pastor Ivy's daughter and my daughter I think they've been like following each other through school. They have the same teacher, they're in the same grade, um, and have been for the last couple of years. So you guys are all, you're all super lucky to have Ivy. Um, I think she's a wonderful pastor. Unfortunately, as you know, she is sick today. So I invite you to for sure keep her and her husband and, and kiddo in your prayers. I'm honored that she asked me to be here today with you and thankful to share with you and I also look forward, too, to our confirmation ministry um, partnership. There's actually five churches in this group that, uh, that will actually be starting later today to go out for some bowling, as was mentioned earlier, with our middle school students. Okay, I'll be honest with you from the get-go. I probably didn't have the amount of time that I normally have in preparing a sermon. I like to stew on things for for a while, and I wasn't scheduled to preach this Sunday, so I found out on Friday that I would be here, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do the best that I got for it here, so, my wife told me to take out a part of it, and I'm, I'm still, I'm, I haven't decided yet, so we'll see when I get to that part. <laughs> I, she's an she's a editor, so she, like, it's great to be married to an editor, she's an attorney um, that writes all day, and so she'll look through my sermons and be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. So it's really, it's really nice. I don't always listen to her though, because then I get in trouble. Um, but I wanted to share with you kind of something that really stood out to me from this passage. Uh, something that I think is actually a pretty difficult message for us to hear. And it's this, that the easy road, the path that we're encouraged to take, is to place our trust in the powers of today. Because we think that they'll save us from our enemies. They'll give us stability, peace, comfort, and wealth. But instead, we see in this gospel text a rebellion movement to begin that seeks to directly challenge who we pledge our allegiance to. I so often place my allegiance, my trust, my hope in the wrong people or things. And I think 
think the story, you're, you're going to say, like, where is he getting that from the story? I think we should unpack the story a little bit here. Because, yeah, there's, there's this very familiar story of fishing and nets. But when we, when we hear this story, there's a lot going on here that's really cool that we're going we're gonna to dive into. Jesus starts by getting the good, this, by getting this news, not good news at all, by getting this news that John is arrested. Okay, so for those of us, we might hear that John's arrested, it's like, oh no, he got handcuffed and put in the clink for the night. That's not what happened at all to John. History tells us that what comes next for John, it is not great. John is this like this beloved figure in Jesus' life. Jesus' cousin, his like mentor figure even. Um, John just baptized him in the river a few passages earlier. And John gets taken by the government on these trumped up charges. And then what happens to John? This is like ear pumps over the kids, right? John's beheaded. He's killed by the government. It's a hard, it's a hard story. I think we can hear the text in this way. Not just as Jesus hearing that John was arrested, but Jesus losing a loved family member. Jesus doesn't see John again. This had to stir up all kinds of emotions too for him. Anger, just right anger. His sense of violation, the loss. I'm sure he felt it deep sadness at this time. And so the response to all this pain that Jesus feels, Jesus just gives up and quietly goes away, right? He decides to just pay his taxes and get a nice job and then retire and write out his pension in his old years, right? That's the end of the story. No, no. Jesus responds to all this by really, this is a catalyst for really starting this movement in his ministry work here. He decides that this event is going to trigger calling his first followers, his disciples. And so he began as many prophets before him by hitting the streets and gathering a group together, starting the movement. Dr. Engelhart, in the commentary on this text, explains it really well how rebellious this act is, too. I wanted to read her words. She says, How is this choosing an allegiance, you ask? As fishermen, Warren Carter notes that these sets of brothers were likely under contract with the Roman Empire. As brothers and possibly members of, co of a cooperative with James and John, they have purchased a lease or contract with Rome's agents that allows them to fish and obligates them to supply a certain quality and quantity of fish. Their actions in following Jesus were a disruption, even if small, to Rome's economic interests. By choosing Jesus, the brothers choose God's rule over Rome. They choose to fish their land, and the people in it for God's purposes, rather than exploiting it for Romans again. They choose to join Jesus' ministry in the promised land, rather than align themselves with the interests of their foreign occupiers. Rome wanted the men to catch fish, to advance the imperialist expansion. Jesus wants them to catch people for God's rule, which is Jesus will demonstrate throughout the rest of the gospel is a rule of mercy, justice, and plenty for all. Okay, so that's the end of the quote. So we often read Jesus, I think, as a little bit of like, this kind of like non-political, like peace and love, almost like maybe a heavy artist kind of a guy. And I think there's definitely that aspect of Jesus. I think we can see that. But Jesus is a multi-dimensional, complicated figure. In this text, He's striking at Rome's economic system in a small way, I'm sure, but a direct and intentional way, as calling his disciples is removing some of the government's income stream. All right, so one of my favorite rock bands growing up as a kid uh, was this band named Rage Against the Machine. Any Rage fans out there? Oh yeah, I got some people that uh, raised their hands. That's awesome. I was expecting like the like the I'm not gonna admit it, right? <laughs> That's, that's fine if you've never heard of this band, but um, I'll be honest, what really drew me to Christianity as a young adult, it wasn't the praise and worship music of trading my sorrows, it was music which messages like this, that we need to rage against the machine. That the machine is not where God wants us to pledge our allegiance. 
So the lead singer of this band, his name is Zach De La Rosa, um, he wrote words that I first heard as a teenager that still haunt me. From the song uh, Killing in the Name of, which is one of the probably more popular if you've heard of them, you've heard this song. He said, some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Killing in the name of, and now you do what they told you. I think that the message of Jesus gets watered down at times. I mean, I'll be honest, I have watered it down, I'm afraid. But this gospel text, it will not let that happen. We need powerful texts like this to stir us up a little bit and to remind us that we can't use religion as a method to justify hatred, violence, racism, things like burning crosses in yards like the KKK still does today, which is what the Rage Against the Machine text was reminding us of. It's crazy that this is still happening today. You might, we might not really like see this on a daily basis, but as we reflect back even three years ago and we think about the killing of George Floyd in our own city, this message of the kingdom of God is still as potent today as it was 2,000 years ago. The most dangerous thing that happens to the gospel is when it becomes used by forces, governments, leaders, or groups to justify actions that go against what Jesus taught. Jesus preaches a message of repentance. And he asked the people today, and then, to return to God. This is like a message that really asks us, who do we pledge our allegiance to? Do we pledge our allegiance to the United States of America? Our military branches? Maybe to the European Union? Now nah, we don't live here. Maybe NATO? Do we pledge our allegiance, in some ways, though, to our employer? Maybe Boston Scientific, Land O'Lake, or Target, that's fine. Our stock managers. Do we pledge our allegiance to Lutheranism? To the ELCA? To mainline Protestantism? Or do we, as the text invites us, pledge our allegiance to God's reign on this earth? God's kingship? God's rule? We have to choose too, don't we? We can't serve both in this life. It's a difficult choice. I know, it's weird in the text, it seems so easy, right? We get Andrew, uh, Simon, Peter, James, John. Jesus calls to them, and what do they do? They just, they just like, they drop their nets. They, like, walk off the job. They immediately follow him. And you have to think that he's, he's found some people that must be fed up with where they're at. They, they've, got, they've got to, to just leave like that. They're sick of being a part of the machine. They know that the promises of Rome are just empty, and that it's just another empire using the means of war, terror, and slavery to reign. Maybe that is you today. Maybe you're fed up with the way that things are, and you're ready to stop following the kingdom of this world and its love of money, power, and wealth, and land, and status, and more and more and more. And you're ready to be a part of this movement that is about justice, Mercy, forgiveness, and plenty for all. But maybe you're comfortable. You enjoy the benefits of the empire. You've prospered and aren't in need of much. I confess to you, my friends, I am this person. I need this sharp reminder more than anyone else. I mean, look at me, straight, white, male, suburbs, homeowner, middle class. The epitome of somebody enjoying the benefits of the machine, right? I, I struggle with this message. It's a hard message that God has called me to give to you today. Because let's be honest, I don't want to hear it. It brings me discomfort. I was thinking about your church's name, Living Water. Man, what a great name. It's so fitting. We are invited today to drink from the living water that flows from God. Living water is a gift given and a marker of what God's kingly reign on this earth looks like. We no longer need to drink from the stagnant, unmoving, dirty water of our own making, bathing in the systems of our own design that can never really wash us. 
can't save ourselves. We can't. No matter how hard we try, and whatever we come up with, we're in need of new living water that comes from outside. It's that alien righteousness that Martin Luther talked about. We can't be made right from anything that we do on our own. It must come from outside of us, infused to us, imputed into us from Jesus. This morning, we are invited and reminded to drink from the living water that refreshes us. So I pray for myself and for you this morning. I pray that I would choose to align myself with God as ruler, that the empire I really belong to is one where everyone has more than they need, and God's living water flows to us all, and all who are in need. And that justice, truth, and right living in relationship with each other would be the way of this kingdom. Grace and peace to you, my friends. Amen.
called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, for the world, and for all those in need. Make your church one in purpose, proclaiming the message of the cross. Help us to work together across differences. Energize ecumenical partnerships, including the World Council of Churches, the Centennial Community Ministerial, and CONFAB. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We rejoice at the bounty of your creation. Fill the land and sea with your abundance. Bless harvests in the southern hemisphere and fallow fields in the northern hemisphere. Equip farmers to till and keep the earth sustainably. We pray especially for communities who are being flooded and are facing destructive storms. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In Christ, your reign comes near and calls all to repentance. Break the rod of the oppressor in every nation. Dispel the shadow of death in places of war and persecution. Grant us leaders who lift the yokes that burden those in need. Lord, in your mercy, be a stronghold for those in trouble and a rock for all those who are afraid especially those in Monterey Park this day. Rouse communities to care for neighbors who need shelter, are facing maltreatment, or are isolated and lonely. We especially pray for Helen Four, Ivy, Bill, and Nora, Mitch, Noel, and Will Ayat, Austin, John, and Don, Nathan, Lori, Kathy, Gabe, Jackie, Lori, Leah, Sue, and all those who are struggling with mental illness or addiction, and those serving in the military, including Griffin. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustain the ministries of this congregation and all the churches in this community, including St. Mark, our Savior's Atonement and Cross of Glory. Nurture each congregation's unique witness to your presence. Foster mutual respect. Inspire our cooperation in loving our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our We praise you for the faithful who have gone ahead of us, both famous and unknown. Help us to leave our hands and follow and bring us with them to the fullness of your promise of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trust in your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please share a sign of peace with those around you. Peace. Peace. <laughs>
Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You will be magnified and adored through Jesus our Savior. Amen. And I invite you to, at this time, to rise as we will say the Lord's Prayer together. We pray in the way that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to give you the, the blessing at the end of the service now, and I want to, to remind you that this blessing, it is not just for you to keep, just yourself. This blessing is a blessing for you to take and to go out into the world and to share with all of those in your life. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always in the name of Jesus. Amen. We sing our sending song, we are marching in the light.